Welcome back to this latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, the president of Dale Kani Training Tokyo Japan. And my special guest today is an old friend of mine, John Flanagan from A&E. John, welcome. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate John, it. John, you know, how is it that you're running, you're the general manager of A&E in Japan, which is a, a major network uh, in the world, in particular, I think, in the States as well. How is it you're running the Japanese operation? How did you get here? What's been happening for Japan for you? How much time do you have? Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> so, <laughs> we can make this a very long interview. No problem. Let's go right through the whole resume. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, my career has, has been based on uh, media and marketing in Japan, basically. I've been in Japan about 30 years. Um, I originally, well, I was actually born here, but I left when I was two, so I, I have no memory of that. So I don't really count that uh, as part of my 30 years. Um, well, why was it you were born here? What were your My father there? was a professor of Japanese political science. Oh. And he, of course, he's retired now, um, mm. uh, but uh, he was here studying and teaching, and uh, I happened to be born halfway through his four years here. So, uh, wow, okay. So uh, I had always had Japan on my mind because, of course, there was my father had art uh, in the house, uh, Byobu and Kokishi and all kinds of things. We had guests come over, and, and whenever you have to write um, where you're born, I always have to write Tokyo, Tokyo Japan. Tokyo, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Nobody knew what that was. I said, is that China? You know, no, yeah. it's not. So um, so it was always on my mind, and um, I had an opportunity to um, study uh, in Japan my junior year in college. My university had a, a relationship with Waseda, and oh, so nice. I applied for that program, got in and really had a great time. I just, I knew I'd just scratched the surface. So I what year get, are we talking there, roughly? What year? Oh, good, you'll date me. That was uh, 1985. I'm just thinking because, you know, uh, probably from 85, uh, on the Plaza Accord, yep. yen just goes unbelievable. The bubble And was they great. start buying everything. Japan really got on the radar. And I was a poor student. Yeah. I couldn't participate in that bubble. <laughs> yeah, really. And I was a poor student who left just before the bubble. Oh, so anyway, wow, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, go on, sorry. Okay, so um, so I really, I, I realized I just scratched the surface. So I, I, that was my third year, so I went back and graduated, and I said, I've got to come back and learn more What Japanese. were you studying in uni, and which uni were you at? Uh, I was studying political economy, mm -hmm. and I was at uh, Colorado College okay, in Colorado right. Springs. So right. I'm originally from Colorado. Well, it's interesting that Colorado had a relationship with Waseda. That's pretty cool. It was actually... Um, a, a, a group of private liberal arts schools throughout the United States had a joint ah, okay. relationship with Waseda. So, right, right, right. so my school, I think that year we sent, including me, two people from my university, and then there were fifty others from different um, universities throughout, wow, throughout the United mm. States. Yeah. Okay. And so you go back, you graduate. What happens? Then? So, so I, the easiest way to get back to Japan is to teach English. So I applied for the JET program. It was the first year of the JET wow, program. You're a star graduate of the JET program. <laughs> Look at you. You're running all these operations in Japan yeah, now. Well, okay, English teachers out there, have faith. You know, yeah, good exactly. things come to you if you it, hang it, around long enough. It, it can. It yeah. can. Yes. So I did that. I was. I they sent to the me to the, the sister state of Colorado, which was Yamagata, mm. which is a great choice because nobody spoke English. And I said, okay, this is. A wonderful chance for me to learn Japanese. Of course, I picked up some accents and dialects uh, on the way. I did that for a year, and then I realized, you know, really, what do I like in terms of industries? And I thought, yeah, media is is for me. Um, I've always enjoyed, you know, newspapers, magazines, TV, um, and I had a job, an opportunity to take a job with Japan Times oh. in Osaka, and I became a reporter. Um, okay. in Osaka, uh, and that was a wonderful time. I met some of my great greatest friends who are still friends uh, today uh, there, and um, it was a really great experience. Um, eventually, I decided I, I need to go back to, to the States because I saw all these expats with these huge apartments and <laughs> enjoying the life, and I was just a poor old reporter thinking, wait a second, wh what am I missing out on? <laughs> and so everybody's saying, well, you got to go back to the States and get hired there. And so I so went back. So for all those aspirant uh, journalists out there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's another hint. <laughs> yes, there's another hint. Um, so I went back to the States and eventually got a job with a company called Liberty Media, mm -hmm. which was the largest cable TV company uh, at the time in the United States. And they had just set up a joint venture with Sumitomo. Oh. And they needed some Japan expertise. Oh, bingo. And, you know, I saw an article in the newspaper. You didn't know that when you applied, though? Or you no, no, I saw, I saw an article in the newspaper. And you said, that's the company I need to join. Yes, exactly. Right. I said, very They're strategic, doing... <laughs> very good. <laughs> so I saw this article and I just sent a letter to the person who was quoted in, in the article. And 
for some reason, she said, we'll come on an, in for an interview. And wow, bingo. next thing you know, I'm working for uh, Liberty Media, and we set up a joint venture with Sumitomo Corporation called JCOM, which is the largest cable TV operator in Japan, um, in 1995. And they sent me here in 95, and I've been here since. Nice. So so that was, uh, that was my entry into uh, cable TV. Um, and then I got into movies with 20th Century Fox. I joined them as a, a head of marketing for theatrical releases, so in the theaters rather than home entertainment. Um, did that for many years. Uh, and then I uh, had an opportunity to go to iTunes with Apple. and, and All did, the time in Japan. Uh, all the time in Japan. Nice. All the time nice. in Japan. And so I led the, the growth of iTunes. I mean, it was started out as a, as a service that people thought, we did surveys, of course, and people thought it was a software to rip your CDs. And actually, no, it's a store to buy... Uh, music, and then eventually I launched the movie store and, and app store and that sort of thing. So, and we of uh, course go out on what is now Apple Podcast. Yes, it used to be called iTunes. And, yes, uh, yes, So yes. We, this will be broadcast on that. So. There we go. There, there we go. go. Great. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I did that for about four years, and then I, for some reason, I decided to become a vacuum cleaner salesman, and I joined Dyson right. as head of marketing. Uh, did right. that for a few years, and. Uh, and then I eventually, um, I, I, was, I wanted to get back into media, um, did a few other things in between, um, but I uh, really needed to get back into media. And when this opportunity came up, I said, I'm, I'm there. I'm and, there. Yeah. And, and so it's, um, it's an industry that's, that's in decline. Um, people are, are sort of what we call cord cutting. They're dropping their cable TV and satellite mm -hmm. services um, for digital options. And so we're all into digital you know, we have rights for all the content that we produce in the United States, and we produce locally a lot of content. Um, and we're on all we're on ten different platforms in Japan uh, for digital uh, SVOD services. So you're doing streaming? Yes, we are. So I think the History Channel is one of the real well-known aspects and this, of yeah, the, the content, Channel, isn't it? It's been in Japan for about twenty years, mm. about twenty-one years this year, um, and uh, we've. Of course, we're well known in in the cable TV and satellite industry in Japan. Um, we've also launched this year two other channels for digital only. One is our, our women's channel called Lifetime, and then Crime Investigation. Um, so, so we have. So the money a, is in the in the women and crime, basically. Actually, Lifetime has done really well on streaming platforms. We're we launched it in February. And it's doing almost as well as history, which has been around for oh, a few wow, years. Oh wow, that's on, amazing! On so digital. quick. Yes. So let's let's talk a little bit about leadership then. In your first uh, couple of iterations here, you know, at some point you wound up not being an individual operator yourself anymore. You've actually got responsibility for people. So, just thinking back to that time, what were some of the challenges that you encountered to run a team here? Mainly, I presume, mainly Japanese team members. I think, yeah, the the biggest challenge is that um, you know I work for you know what Western U.S. organizations mostly, uh, except for Dyson was U.K. But um, the the demands on speed uh, to deliver growth um, are exponentially higher than any Japanese organization. Mm. So when you encounter um, a culture that's used to the slow moving consensus-based, mm -hmm. you know, decision-making process, mm -hmm. it doesn't fit with what the demands are from headquarters. Mm -hmm. So how do you leverage that sort of cultural um, uh, norm in Japan to do something much faster and much more creative? Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's the, the biggest challenge I had. Uh, and the answer is? And the answer is, well, first you have to have patience, and that's why I have no hair anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think the real thing is, um, you know, the, the understanding, first of all, the cultural background. People are used to, I mean, it's a very hierarchical structure in Japanese organizations, and, uh, but it's also bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, and so this consensus based decision making process mm -hmm. comes from the bottom, and the top guy gets in. But of course, really incredible respect for the top guy. And, and as you know, people in Japanese companies, they don't call the president or the division head by their name, mm -hmm. it's their title. Title, yeah, Jacho, 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 yeah. Jacho, something. Yeah. Jacho, you know, so it's, it's very, <laughs> you know, different and kind of very foreign for people who initially come to Japan. People are used to this very hierarchical structure. And so um, you can, as a Western manager, just force your agenda through, but that really turns people off. I mean, and people become robots and just wait for things. And so 
the only way you can be successful with that is that if you are this creative, incredible genius and <laughs> you can do anything and just have your minions do things for you. That's, I mean, anybody who's run an organization knows that the best way to be successful is to have th the team come together and build things, you know, with you and come up with ideas and that sort of thing. And it's exponentially better than what you can do on your own. So mm. how do you do that? So basically, you got to give the team ownership and you got to explain what the, the needs are and speed and the goals are for the company, make sure everybody understands that. And it's not top down. It's OK, let's come up with some ideas. And so in sense of when you first started leading, you probably didn't know any of that. No, you probably have got someone in headquarters biting your ear saying, Flanagan, where's those results, you know? So you're probably thinking, well, I've got, to, I've got to really hit this baby hard and we've got to go. So you're trying to push and at some point you realize this isn't working, you know. And so at some point you realize I've got to change my angle. So how long did it take you to realize you couldn't forcefully drive everything through and you couldn't be the sole source of truth on everything? <laughs> Very early, actually. Um, uh, I think it helped because um, I was younger. Um, it was when I was working at uh, JCOM. Mm -hmm. And um, the partner was Sumitomo, and it was loaded with guys with gray hair and dark suits. And I was just a young kid. What do I know? And I was given, you know, pretty significant responsibility, and realized I was hitting a brick wall. So I really need to pay deference to my elders, um, but also get them involved in these new things that we have to do. You know, for example, we we launched a telephone service, which was unheard of. It, I mean, NTT is a service, and there are some long-distance services, but we started the first local telephone service, and nobody, nobody thought we could do that, um, and, but we did, and we brought people in, and uh, team members in, and we, we worked with them, and we said, hey, let's, let's build this together. Um, now, the idea of the phone system, is that coming from you, or is that coming from them, or where does that idea it was, spring from? It was headquarters, because um, so cable TV um, has, you know, traditionally was, was a... TV only service, um, but early on they realized, well, we have all this fiber and coaxial yeah. cable running yeah, right to the home and to uh, straight to the home, and we have open bandwidth, mm. so we can leverage that for other things. And so, headquarters to, in this sense means America. Yes, right. Liberty Media in this sense, and Liberty Media already had a joint venture with um, a big telephone service uh, company in, called US West at the time in the UK. And uh, they created a, a cable TV company that also offered a telephone service. So I'm just imagining you popping into the uh, into the meeting of the seniors, saying, "By the way, I got this great idea. We're going to launch a telephone service." I can just imagine the reaction. You know, it was it was no NTT. No, everybody trusts NTT. How can we do anything like that? Mm -hmm. um, and so we actually brought in some engineers and experts on that, and I was leading the. The, the service side of it, so the pricing and um, uh, the, the negotiations with the government to get approvals. And, and, you know, NTT initially said, well, we're losing money on local, so we're going to have to charge you more than what you can charge your customers for any local calls. Just to drive it just, you out. Just, yeah, it was, it was that bad. And so yeah, we had yeah. some serious negotiations with the, with the government at the time. So and eventually we got uh, a good deal. Yeah. So that was an interesting experience for you to realize that you can use the hierarchy in a positive way instead mm -hmm. of it being a barrier. What yep. were some other challenges you came across, you know, say with the people reporting to you? Like you don't want them to be robots. You want them to be involved. So yep. how did you go about getting them involved? Because often, you know, when you're the leader, there's a fair bit of ego and self-belief yep. attached. Well, I'm the leader because mm. I know something or I can do something. Otherwise, you'd be the leader. So you should do what I say. I mean, there's a fair bit of that attached to leadership. So how did you get them involved? How did you engage them? So, so that's, I mean, that's a real big thing. I think a lot of leaders come in, you know, the rock star leader type and, you know, I'm the, I'm the guy, you know. That's, that doesn't work. I mean, you, you need to be humble, um, kind, understanding, and open. And if you are all those things, and trustworthy, of course, you got to be true to your word. If you are all those things, people will come to you automatically and start talking to you. 
Um, and that you create this environment where it's it's open and people can say what they want. Um, sometimes you don't want to hear it, but that's okay. You know, you just listen to it and then let's say, well, okay, how do we solve this? You know, a lot of times it will find people that I found people that just complain and well, okay, that's I hear you, but what's the solution? And we work together to find that solution. And what, and then you give people responsibility. So they come up with an idea, and if they come up with an idea, that means they own it. And so they have responsibility to make sure that it works. It's not me saying, here's my idea, you do it. Then they'll go, okay, maybe I'll, I'll work on it sometimes. you know. But if it's their idea and they own it, and you influence, obviously, them to come up with that idea and that direction, once you do that, then you've got an engaged workforce who is totally committed to getting their idea, of course you influenced again, but their idea to fruition. Uh, so that's, I think I found that was the key, yeah. And you know, you moved across different organizations and I guess the, the team sizes probably varied a little bit too. Did, and I, but I'm, I imagine in the sort of marketing area, you really have like 500 people in the marketing department you've got to run, you know. They're normally pretty tight teams, I guess. But did you find any any challenges when you started to move from one business, not necessarily business, but one company to another, uh, where you know maybe there's some existing team members, or maybe you're recruiting team members? You know, I'm not quite sure how that transition worked across those companies you work for. But were there any challenges around uh, you come in as a new guy from a different company with the existing team, or challenges around you come in you've actually got to start a team from zero? I'm not quite sure if you had that experience or not. Yeah, I've had both experiences. Can we um, talk a little bit about both, sort of being the new guy in an existing team and being the guy who creates the team? Because they're yep. both challenging and they're um, right. Got some interesting stories on that one. So, Great, let's hear yeah, them. All right. Okay, so, bring them on. So um, I was in pay TV um, and I got a job at um, 20th Century Fox Marketing Movies. So, you know, in the past, of course, it's changing now, but movies were like the top. TV is that little thing that, you know, most actors don't even want to deal with unless they're poor and not very famous. So I got into the movies and, um, and I, I, you know, the, my bosses knew that I interviewed with the guys in LA and all that. And they knew I was from TV, but they liked my ideas and said, okay, we need somebody who knows entertainment and can change the marketing. So I get in there and all these old guys who are, have that mindset about movies are top and this, this young, well, not young guy anymore, but this guy comes in from TV. He's going to tell us what to do? Oh, come on. You know, it was that kind of thing. And, and so I realized, all right, I mean, they're not being cooperative, but we need to change some things. And, for example, one of the easiest things that we changed early on was um, most of our budget was spent on TV and newspaper. This is a long time ago. Um, and everybody believed that newspaper was absolutely essential. And so I had to say, well, actually, internet's kind of growing, and we should think about that. Said, well, no movie companies advertise on the internet in Japan, so we shouldn't mess around with that. We should stick with our TV and newspaper. And I said, okay, well, the data shows that it's only people 50 and over who read the newspaper, and very few people read, which they had a Yukon, which is a second uh, edition that was published in the, in the evening, which is now gone for the most part, which... Actually, movie companies invested a lot of advertising in that Yukon, the evening uh, edition. Um, and pe very few people read that. So don't you think we should try something else? And they kind of grudgingly accepted it. And I said, well, let's do an experiment. Um, let's try one movie campaign where we shift 10% of our newspaper budget to internet and see what it does. And it was a huge success. And Next time, next budget came around for the next movie. You know, we launched about 20 movies a year. Um, uh, the guy said, no complaints. I mean, nobody came up to me afterward and said, John, you were right. You're amazing. They, nobody said that. But the next budget we came across, of course, we had over 10% of the budget on Internet, and no one said a thing. And it was successful. So it didn't go from 10% to 50%, for no. example. No, we it wasn't that a, bold. No, no, no. It was a 10% shot start, you know, and so just it's an experiment. So you, when you're facing amazing opposition by entrenched interests, you don't want to just go 180. You want to do something incremental, I found, and this was a great way to test it, you know, and say, okay, let's try it on this movie. It's interesting, it too. I'm just going to ask a bit of a controversial question here. But there's also no shortage of incidences where uh, production companies uh, – 
putting money under the table, to the buyers, you know, uh, cases where people are being entertained by the buyer, mm-hmm. you know. So I'm wondering if, I don't know if that was the case in your industries, but sometimes it's not just necessarily a straight business decision. You know, they've obviously been entertained by people who are the buyer and they feel some obligation. So regardless of how good the idea is, I'm obligated to keep these guys at the main main frame. So uh, did you ever run across any sort of corruption? Because the media industry has got a lot of that hidden away inside it. Uh, we know the, the the nasty little secrets behind the, you know, behind the doors, what actually goes on. But I'm not sure if you ever came across that as an aspect. Well, you know, as, a, as an American company, um, we can't entertain any of that. Any no, of but when you're things. the buyer, though, yeah. you're, you're the one buying, uh, you know, your Getting Japanese colleagues, for example, yeah. Maybe uh, being entertained by the people who are, you know, they're, they're buying the, uh, you know, the space from or whatever. Mm-hmm. Does that ever come up? Well, you know, entertaining is a part of business culture in Japan. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you you do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you must be clear that it's not going to lead to any sort of favorable position. Mm-hmm. Everything mm-hmm. has to be dry and mm-hmm. um, you really need to make sure that, you know, all buying decisions are made on, you mm-hmm. know, proper business Analytics. Well, I'm thinking that you may be thinking that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just wondering about those uh, so just other to, colleagues, whether they were thinking that. I, well, I, I don't recall a case where that happened, but just make sure that you're watching and mm-hmm. making sure that all buying, major buying decisions, you can't f- follow everything, are being done in you know a, a proper mm-hmm. manner. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I, I digress, but yeah. keep going. No, but uh, another thing is, though, uh, it's, it's important you say that because it's important that you set an example as a leader, too. So at many companies, we were get, being sent gifts. You know, personally, I was getting these gifts. Um, and, you know, instead of sending them back, I would just say, put them on the table and say, hey, staff, here yeah. are the gifts. Take them home. You know, and the previous bosses, they would, you know, take stuff home. Um, and I wouldn't take anything home. Mm. Just want to set an example that, mm. that this is not for me. This, we're getting this because we're doing business with them mm-hmm. so let's share it with everybody mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and it was it was pretty prevalent in the movie industry and yeah. i was quite quite surprised to see mm-hmm. all these gifts you know we were getting bags of rice and sake and you know all kinds of nice things mm-hmm. cans of beer of course that a lot of people do that um uh and so just just give don't take it home just mm-hmm. make Spread sure it yourself, yeah, yeah. Dilute the influence, yeah. or or save it up and have a party, yeah. for the whole team, yeah. which is great. And then then you have a you know a bonding session, you know, mm. with the gifts mm. funded by your your supplier. So uh, right. I think that's the best way to deal with it. Yeah. yeah. So that was a, that was a case of of uh, you know existing team. You come in, new idea, internet, good example. What about the other case where you've actually got to go and build a team? Because I'm sure once that ten percent spend really registered, suddenly your credibilities went sky high. But nobody told me that. No one, no one, <laughs> no one mentioned that in passing, but they allow the next 10% yeah. and it probably increased over time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that established your credibility because you've got to win there, right? Yeah. What about in the case of where you are recruiting people and you've got to get them to come and work for you? What have you found was challenging about that? Because a lot of viewers will be in this situation where – or listeners will be in this situation where they're trying to recruit people. Mm-hmm. And uh, depending on the, the company, you know, sometimes it's surprising that, I mean, if you're a name brand, you're Panasonic or something like that, that's a completely different Apple. matter, right? Yeah. But if you're not, yeah. well, particularly you're a Western company too, yeah. and maybe not a familiar Western company, mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, the grandparents get involved. The parents are involved in the decision. It's just not the individual you're trying to hire. And these are people in their thirties, yeah. you know. And we're talking about not kids straight out of university, you know. And sometimes you think, well, I can't join your company because my wife, my wife's parents are opposed to the idea. Or you're just sitting there going, what are you talking about? Are you an adult or what? But that's Japan, right? So it's not so straightforward just to say, come on to this new enterprise. Mm-hmm. So what was your experience of getting people to join? What did you find worked well? Well, I've never hired, hired people straight out of college. Okay. Uh, I've always hired experienced people, um, mm-hmm. and I think most Western companies tend to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, I mean, just explain the vision. Mm-hmm. And, well, it, it, I've been, had the chance to be in, in sort of growing and innovative uh, companies. So we always are demanding new ideas and interesting things. So that's been helpful. If, if I was, you know, selling detergent or something like that, 
wouldn't be as exciting and maybe more difficult to um, get people excited to join. But I've always been lucky to be in sort of innovative industries. And so basically I just talk about what we're trying to do, how we're trying to change things, and all the cool opportunities that you can have by joining the team and, and being a part of this big change mm. that we're trying to implement. So that mm. that was, I think, just sh- sharing the vision and sharing the culture and just getting people comfortable. You know, the office environment is is very important, um, and the office location is also very important. It's, it's shocking for many in Western the, companies. In the media business, just by way of reference, I'm just trying to think if I've been to any media offices. I don't think I have. But Please come and visit us. Yeah, but I'm just thinking, <laughs> is it, like, really gorgeous and, like, you know... Um, just blow your mind when you walk in. It's like massive, you know, things on the wall or, you know, parts of movie scenes leaping out of the wall at you or this sort of stuff. Is it, is it that, or is it just a typical nice office or is it sort of something spectacular? Uh, well, I mean, you know, in the movie business, the offices are not that nice, um, but, uh, but things related to the movie business are all over. I mean, posters on the mm-hmm. wall and mm-hmm. standees. Standees are the things that the cardboard things you see in movie theaters. Mm-hmm. They're out there and they're all current. They're updated to what's right, the movie. Right. So you're always seeing some changes right. there. So it's exciting. And there, there may be some trinkets on, you know, on tables and things like that. Um, so it, you feel part of the movie mm-hmm. business. In, in TV, um, you know, in our company, we just we have a more sort of serene thing where we do have some posters and that sort of mm-hmm. thing, and we have our logos and mm-hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. And of course, we have TVs showing mm-hmm. our live stuff, streaming yeah. stuff mm-hmm. and and our our live broadcast as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so just you know, having things. I mean, it's not very. I mean, we're frugal as well, and you have to be frugal and. And a movie is a very risky business, um, even though the budgets are high. Uh, TVs, you know, it's a, as I said, it's a declining business, but we're growing mm. in in many, many different areas, including digital. Um, so um, we have to be frugal, and uh, but we have to be look nice, mm. um, and that's important. So you don't have to really spend a huge amount of money to create this palace. Mm-hmm. Uh, just have something that's nice and comfortable, mm-hmm. and the location is really important. I think a lot of you know. Westerners come in saying, "Well, I just want some cheap office space in the suburbs, and and because you know, what we do in in L.A. or whatever, and we drive to work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and you're not <laughs> as gonna opposed do that. to catch the subway, right? Yeah. So you you need to be in, in a location the location that's very convenient for people, something central, um, and you don't have to buy the the get into the latest newest building." But something that's convenient uh, mm. that you can decorate the office mm. uh, frugally um, mm-hmm. in a way that's tasteful. So. Yeah, we blew all our entire budget on this big day. There you here, go. Look so at that. Yeah, <laughs> the entire profit went right there. You know? <laughs> but uh, thinking about uh, getting innovation, you mentioned before about that bottom-up ownership, uh, take uh, responsibility, accountability. Right. One of the things we find all of us is that there's uh, a big risk aversion component of Japanese culture and uh, better to do nothing than do something and be wrong. Uh, And so the inertia to do nothing is very strong in in the work culture here too. So when you're trying to get innovation where it's really either you can have the Kaizen style of incremental innovation or rather breakthrough innovation, doesn't matter which one you talk about, although Kaizen is probably a bit more acceptable. What have you found works in terms of the actual creativity component of getting innovation from teams? Well, I think you have to go back to like, why are Japanese so risk adverse? Great. And, and I found, luckily I found out um, when I was working at JCOM and I talked to all my Sumitomo buddies, well, the older guys with gray hair and dark suits. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I kept saying, well, why, you know, what's going on? We need to do these new things. Why is there so much? And, you know, of course, after lots of sake and all that sort of thing, and, um, I found out that uh, in this one guy had made a big error in his past and it caused a big problem. Um, he says, once you make one mistake, you have a black X on your back for the rest of your career. At it's company. in the HR scorebook. Flanagan screwed up. Yeah. yeah. So, so hence, yeah. people know that. And it's lifetime employment. Yeah. Basically. So people aren't just changing jobs and, and it's better if you have lifetime employment to not make a mistake, but not do and it's okay not to do anything. As long yeah. as you get older, your salary still goes up. So people used to yeah. that culture are not gonna do anything. Not they they don't fit well in a 
Western company. Right. But it doesn't mean they can't change. Mm. It means it means you must be uh, must be open to people making mistakes mm. and uh, say that. Look, look, you know, we have these amazing goals that we have to reach. And it's okay to make a mistake mm. because, you know, we need to get to this goal. So let's try it out, you know, and, and go forward. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the leadership training for managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. It's interesting, so, you know, just talk a little bit about your handling of mistakes because, you know, we teach, uh, we teach in our leadership training program, leadership uh, training for managers about handling mistakes. And I remember we were teaching the class and a Japanese guy, he said, uh, yeah, when I was young, I made a mistake. My boss threw an ashtray in my head. This is back in the day when he had ashtrays, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine if you're coming out of a Japanese old style system like that, yeah. where mistakes are taken really seriously. And uh, who was I talking to the other day was telling me that, uh, again, another Japanese case, the guy was, um, he was working in this company and someone made a mistake. Uh, he dropped something. He dropped something. And the president, for an hour, an hour, full, full voice in front of everyone, just berated this guy. And this guy was like a, a section head, you know, he wasn't yeah. some minion yeah, down here, yeah, he was yeah. a section head, yeah. just berated the guy. So it was like, and this is, you know, like, wow, okay. So I think we've moved on from there. But in terms of how, you know, when you, when mistakes happen, what do you say to people? You know, okay, mistakes come to your attention. Well, the first problem is, does a mistake come to your attention as the boss? That's the first problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because often arrives, they're all ninja at hiding mistakes, and you only find out about it when it's almost too late to do anything about it. Yeah. But if you do actually find out about it, what do you say to that person? How do you approach it? Well, say, I'm, I'm the guy, I'm your guy, and I made a mistake here. What would you say to me? Well, first of all, part of having an open culture and people can feel free to talk to you is important so, so that prevents people from hiding mistakes. But mm -hmm. if you're if you're going to throw an ashtray at somebody or you're going to berate them for an hour, no one's going to tell no you anything. Tell anything right no, here. no, absolutely. Hide so, that baby as long as you can. Yeah, absolutely. So so basically, you know, it's like, I'm, and people luckily do come to me and say, look, you know, I made this mistake. And, and okay, that's fine. All right. I mean, I don't say, that. of course, that's fine. But say, look, okay, what did we learn from this? And I think that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And so how can we avoid this in the future? And how is their yeah. reaction? Because I'm sure if you've grown up in a Japanese environment, that's probably the last thing you're going to hear from your Japanese bosses. Yeah, yeah. What did we learn from this? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's probably going to be more scolding about it's, being more absolutely. careful next time, you idiot, or else, you know. So how's their reaction? It must be a bit uh, – it must take them back a little bit, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, it might, maybe so. But I, I think um, it, it means people then trust you. Mm. I mean – it shows that you're looking out for them, mm -hmm. them and their well-being and their growth, um, personally and professionally, mm -hmm. um, and that builds, you know, loyalty and trust. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's it's really really important to do mm -hmm. that. So and it's also too, I think, to be observed doing that, not the sense of, well, scolding people, you know, at, at full roar in front of everybody, absolutely no no. Although as we've heard that happens, but uh, but the obvious way of not berating someone so that others watch. People watch, you know, boss watching around the globe is a very fine art and people can tell from the look on your face, the, the gait, you know, how you hold your shoulders, oh, is it a good day to bring this up for the boss or not? You know, they're making these judgments all the time. They're reading us, right? Yeah. Like a, like a, like a novel. What's going on with this guy? What should I do? So when they see or they hear 
that you didn't blow up, you didn't berate the person, you didn't, you know, bawl them out, you, you asked that question, then that tells the others, oh, okay, it's safe, you know, and, uh, you know, well, I feel more confidence if I have a problem to talk to John directly about it. So that's a very important to be walking the talk, isn't it? Very, very important, very, very mm. important. And, but, you know, I've had other, you know, senior people under me on my team mm -hmm. who exhibited that wrong behavior. Right. And, um, and, and sometimes not in front of me. I hear it from somebody else because mm -hmm. I rarely <laughs> see it um, uh, directly, but I hear they it from other for people. They wait for you while you're on lunch. <laughs> yeah, or away, and you know, as we're working from home now, more often yeah, it's yeah, yeah. you know I'm not always there. We're not always together. But when I hear about it, I, I mean, I, I confront the person and say, "Look, you know, we can't talk to people like that. Mm. This is you know very important." And luckily, my company right now is is got very you know tight policies on mm -hmm. creating a caring workplace. Psychologically safe yeah. environment. That's the buzzword, yeah, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Radical candor is the, the word. Oh, that's, I haven't that, heard that one. Radical yeah, candor. Radical candor is the word right now. Okay. And there's a whole book and series on that. So so our company in New York has embraced, um, our headquarters is in New York. What the hell does that. radical candor mean? No, that, exactly what you just said. It's creating a, a safe environment mm -hmm. where people are, are feel safe and are comfortable. Um, and so that the, that that allows direct feedback. Okay. So pe and people are not threatened by that oh, direct okay. feedback. So, so you, you can, can be quite candid, Yeah. but it's not going to blow somebody up. Yeah. So right. And, of course, that's how you say it as well. You can't mm. throw an ashtray or berate somebody. you mm. got to be, of course, polite. And you're giving the feedback because you care about them. Mm. And, and mm. that's the kind of the concept that mm. we're trying to implement. We're, okay, we're nice. not... 100% successful yet. Well, <laughs> coming, well, yeah, we're all a work in progress, right? Me included, trust me. Yeah. The trouble is I've got all these Dale Carnegie principles for human relations, which I have to uphold, which puts a bit of pressure on the old boss here, you know, yeah, there you go. and how you behave. But uh, thinking about innovation, actually the, the core of getting creativity, innovation, ideas from them, not from you, because often we are the source of a lot of ideas because we're coming from a different angle, being foreigners, growing up in different environments. We see things differently, more information from headquarters than maybe they've got. Uh, and so we, we often are the spark. But what have you found as an actual technical manner, a uh, methodology of getting ideas from people that works well for you, if anything? Uh, well, I mean, I think, first of all, making sure the team understands the goals that we mm -hmm. have, mm -hmm. you know, we always have to deliver growth every year, no matter mm -hmm. what's happening. And, and mm -hmm. we've been able to do that despite our, our traditional industry being in, mm -hmm. in a slow decline. Mm -hmm. We found other revenues, uh, revenue streams and new areas to grow. Um, so making sure the team understands, you know, what our, what we have to deliver mm -hmm. and then saying, okay, well, how can we do that? And let's mm -hmm. come up with some ideas. And sometimes mm -hmm. you do brainstorming sessions, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you do other things and, um, you know, we've come up with some really interesting ideas, you know. In the brainstorming sessions, have you found any particular brainstorming methodology that works well? Because often in my experience, the brainstorming methodology that people use are not so great. I remember my bosses be standing next to the whiteboard with a marker pen going, give me some ideas, and then butchering people as they gave the <laughs> no, ideas no, 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 if they no, didn't yeah. like them, you know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. what have you found that works a bit better than well, that? No, like any idea is okay. With that kind right. of, okay. it, just have that out there. And then people right. come up with some crazy things. Of course, that's not going to work. And then everybody laughs and has a good time, you know. So creating that yeah. environment where mm -hmm. it's okay to, you know, have some idea that's that's mm -hmm. not going to work. Mm -hmm. And people aren't laughing because they're ridiculing. They're just mm -hmm. laughing because it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so having that environment where it's okay to do that. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, you just standing up, could give me an idea. That's not going to work. And, and yeah, so it didn't work well in our situation. Yeah, absolutely. That absolutely. organization, I can tell you. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's all part of creating that environment where people are, is open and people can speak their mind. Um, mm. and, and once that's in place, it's easier for people to participate in these, mm. these brainstorming sessions. Yeah. So, for example, we, you know, we were a, a pay TV only service and we know our business was declining a few percent every year. So we so said, what can we do? Okay, the obvious answer is everybody's going digital, so let's go all in to digital. And so we started from zero and got onto 10 different platforms and we added new brands on digital only. Okay, that's great, that's growing. The growth is not quite as high as it was in the first couple of years. What do we do next? You know, and we were doing some, we have, of course, we produce programs as well, so we're doing some, some uh, uh, using our program skills to say, okay, why don't we do this for advertisers? And we create documentaries or videos for advertisers and we got a whole lot of new business from that and that's a big growth area um, and then we said all right 
how can we leverage this further? Why don't we become, can you believe this, why don't we become an ad agency? And that was our creative partner's business. Is, so we have clients who actually come to us uh, to create a marketing plan um, and we create TV spots for them. We create other advertisement materials for them. And we go out and buy media for them. So it's sort of vertical integration now, isn't Totally, it? yeah. And yeah. we go buy media, third-party media, not even our channel. Right. Um, and, you know, this client that we have, one client, our biggest one, um, it, they, they're after a very young target. And, of course, History Channel is not a young target. So, so we're I not like buying. it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, me too. I <laughs> guess we're a little bit older. but um, uh, So we're not even buying on our – we're – Completely separate business, and so we created this ad agency business, and we're also. Are you using influencers on that? Just as a from a, this is not really a leadership we, topic now, but just by are you going to that extreme of using uh, sponsoring influencers to uh, promote? We've done a little bit, but haven't gone full mm-hmm. full on into that area. Okay. Um, right. uh, clients are not asking for that yet, but okay. we've hired um, you know. So Japanese football soccer stars uh, right. to appear in some TV spots right. and, well, that's and do some things. Yeah. Standard thing, pretty standard, it? yeah. It's pretty standard. Celebrity led, isn't it? E- exactly. It's not an influencer thing. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about trust. You've you've, you've touched on it a few points here about the importance of trust. In terms of your experience so far with different teams, what have you found that works well in gaining people's trust? Well, walking the talk. Yep. Obviously, I mean, it, be true to your word. Yep. Um, and if if you are true to your word, um, people say, well, well, I can trust this guy. Mm-hmm. And that's really important. Um, so don't go back on your word at do all. Do you, um, I mean, we don't do it these days because we're all locked up at home maybe for the most part, but a lot of the traditional Japanese trust building is that nomication, you know, where they're out drinking after hours, you know, spending, well, they're spending long days together anyway. Yep. You know, yeah. working in ridiculously late hours and then going to the pub, you know. Uh, has that been a feature of your leadership or not? Uh, yeah, well, it's a cultural thing in Japan. And, and of course, I try and we have a big effort to, to reduce overtime at our company because some mm. people had they've been working too much. Mm. Um, and it's for their health and, you mm-hmm. know, just it, it produ- redu- I mean, increases productivity if people are, are not so tired and that sort of thing. So yep. we're, we're trying to work really hard on that. But drinking after, after hours is a cultural you know, practice of, mm-hmm. of business in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it's very important. And um, how about yourself? Do you doing that? Oh, yeah, yeah I do that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I guess for some reason I like drinking as well. So <laughs> I don't have a hard time with that, you know. So, um, uh, uh, and people like going out. And so I'm, I'm happy to mm-hmm. do that. And that is very important to build trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's a cultural aspect of Japan. So even if you don't drink alcohol, go. Mm. You know, and have food and some soft drink and that mm. sort of thing. Well, it's a good thing about yeah. Japan. It's not like that Australian English culture where it's drinking and rather than eating. You know, it's yeah, actually yeah. it's always drinking and food. It's more like a European tradition of you always having something together as a combination. Yep, it's a bit a lot more sensible, isn't yes, it? Really? Yes, yeah. healthier too. Yes. Yeah, Aussies are not that sensible, unfortunately. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. and so okay, in terms of um, being, you know, you've worked in different organisations, and each organisation has their own culture, internal culture, right? And also then you're trying to build a culture inside your own team in Japan. So you get a Japanese version of the Mm -hmm. corporate culture, I suppose. What have you found works well to build a culture? Have you been able to build, like when you were in these different organizations, like when you were at Dyson, was it, were you building a Dyson culture around the marketing team or uh, some of these other organizations, you know, uh, building a culture around that? Have you tried that? Did that work? Well, yeah, being part of a, a big global organization, usually there is there is sort of a, a, a set culture that yep. comes from headquarters. Yep. And, you know, just having people understand what that is and, mm-hmm. and exhibiting that in mm-hmm. the local office mm-hmm. is really important. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've been working mostly at big companies with those cultures. Um, uh, so uh, it's just making sure that that, that is understood by the I'm team. I'm thinking more have, trying to translate yeah. that Western, usually Western culture into a Japanese context. Yeah. Like we're a global organization, right? We've got 200 offices in, you know, all around 100 plus countries around the world. And there is a Dale Carnegie culture. But here in Japan, we've built a Japanese Dale Carnegie culture, which has got its own little, you know, tribal things going for it. You know, it's quite tribal. 
not, and it just sort of emerged. It wasn't like Craig didn't sit down and think, right, tribalism, how am I going to, you know, take the Dale Carnegie global culture and then cook it down to a Japanese version and tribalize it? It didn't work like that. It just sort of evolved. Yep, yep. But I'm just wondering if you've found things that have been helpful to get a Japanese version of the, the global culture or the headquarter culture. Well, we're, we're all in Japan and we're, and this is a Japanese culture. It's very unique and, and there are lots of amazingly positive aspects about the culture in Japan. Um, so you're not going to change Japanese culture. It's, it's impossible. Um, you can change some behaviors and that sort of thing. So, so that culture will always be there in the workplace. And so I, so I was trying to address this by saying, well, how can I get our corporate culture to be a part of this Japanese culture? Mm -hmm. And that's what I spent time on just explaining, okay, mm -hmm. here's what we're, what this company is about, here are mm -hmm. our values. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies now are stating exactly what their values are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually in quite detail, many companies are doing that. And so mm -hmm. I'm spending a lot of time uh, doing that as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so, I mean, you're not going to be able to change Japanese culture, um, but you can tweak things and mm -hmm. get them to understand what the, the global vision is mm -hmm. and p have people behave that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to get rid of some, uh, not rid of, but uh, mitigate things like risk adverse act mm -hmm. behavior and mm -hmm. and slow movement behavior mm -hmm. which is really a product of the the post war mm -hmm. lifetime employment mm -hmm. um, structure in Japan mm -hmm. not a traditional japanese cultural aspect mm -hmm. so um, so but the traditional cultural, cultural aspects remain and mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get rid of those, mm. which is good because we all like living in Japan and enjoying that culture. Yeah. We do. There's lots of pluses about that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, thinking about leadership, if you were going to come up with uh, a definition of leadership, what would it be? Well, I think a, a leader, maybe I don't have a nice tight phrase, but a leader, um, uh, first of all, has to get his team motivated. So it's mm -hmm. got to get, got to be a motivator. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have a responsibility to develop your team mm -hmm. um, personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are the two most important things mm -hmm. um, that a leader must do. And also provide some vision, mm -hmm. you know. So I think those three things are, are really key. Okay. Uh, mm. So if we we're going to give some advice to someone who is being sent out to Japan, okay, blogs, you've got to go to Japan. They don't know Japan. They don't know the Japanese culture. They don't speak the language, but they, they know the business. They know the headquarter company or whatever. And they're going to turn up here and they're going to be on a posting probably three to five years usually, hopefully not three. <laughs> hopefully they give them longer than that. Yeah. Uh, what would be some advice you'd give them? What should they do or not do? Yeah, there's a lot of advice. Well, what, what's really helped me is understanding the Japanese culture and mm -hmm. the language. And, of course, if you've never studied it and you're just sent mm -hmm. off the boat, it's more difficult to pick that up. But it's important to, to mm -hmm. show, make an effort to mm -hmm. learn, and that will help you mm -hmm. understand things. Um, and uh, one thing is you need to be patient um, because I think one word I, I use to describe Japanese business is vague. Mm -hmm. Because people don't really say what they mean, you know, uh, what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. So it's important to sort of pick out things. So be patient and try to ask questions to, mm -hmm. to get the answer, mm -hmm. find the meaning behind what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it comes from a cultural aspect of people being polite and they mm -hmm. don't want to give bad news or be seem critical and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they're trying to say something, a hint at something. And so... Be patient, ask questions, and try to bring these things out. Mm -hmm. And eventually, with your team, they'll know it's okay to, you know, be more blunt. Harmony um, is more important than truth. Absolutely. In absolutely. Japan, right? Absolutely. Much yeah. more important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you see it in all aspects of mm -hmm. Japanese culture and business and politics and all that. So, mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, though. I mean, one of the things as an Australian, you know, yeah, when I, I look at America and American culture particularly, the concept of my rights is very, very strong in, in America compared to Australia, even as a sim, very similar multicultural yeah, big continent, similar, yeah. you know, English uh, colonial heritage. Yep. Uh, maybe we haven't quite gotten over our English colonial heritage like you have, <laughs> never became a republic. But 
Uh, that doesn't fly so well in Japan about my rights. So, you know, those, when you're coming from that type of conceptual background to a country that actually is not based like that as a leader, you've got to make some, some steps there to really adjust yourself on, on how things are going to work. What do you think some advice for those sorts of adjustments? A leader coming in stating about Well, they think, one. you know, oh, well, this is how it should be. Because this is how we do it in America, you right? Know? Oh, that's always the case. Mm. That's always the case. I mean, mm. And and even as a leader in Japan, you're facing pressure from headquarters to say, mm. "Well, this is how we do it in America. You should do mm. the same thing mm -hmm. in Japan." Mm -hmm. um, but throw that away, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 just say, "Okay, what what's going to work in Japan?" Mm -hmm. Of course, we have these goals. Mm -hmm. We have this product or this mm -hmm. service. How do we alter it or mm -hmm. tweak it to mm -hmm. fit? in the Japanese situation mm -hmm. uh, is really important. So in, in the movie business, it was always like that. Um, uh, and so the movie's done and we can't, of course, change anything. Mm. Uh, of course, no one would listen to us anyway. <laughs> so, um, they spent all the money for yeah, that, right? Yeah, and so now you sell it and mm. you, you got to give us $100 million on this movie for, but for box office in Japan. Well, okay. That's, but so we, we look at the movie and they say, okay, we spent all this money making trailers and TV spots and just use them. And we look at that and say, no, that's, this movie is not going to appeal to Japanese with that cell. Um, I think my, my biggest early example uh, was a movie called iRobot. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember that. That was well, a good movie. Yeah, I watched a good that. Movie. It was yeah, a good movie. Yeah, Will Smith I like that. and all Will that. Smith, yeah, it was a good yeah, movie. So the, the, I started you, to like that robot in the end. Absolutely. So <laughs> that, that was the key to that movie. So in, in the U.S., the whole thing was one man against all these evil robots. So, yeah, and yeah. the title was, the catch copy was One Man Saw It Coming. Yeah. And it was Will Smith with this phalanx of robots behind him. Yeah. It looked really scary. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and in Japan, you know... And one people, looking at him, right? Yeah. <laughs> in people, that shot. Yeah, absolutely. You remember it. Thanks. Uh, so in Japan, robots are our friends. And we grow up, you know, Japanese grew up with Astro Boy and all these... Yep. Astro and, Boy, and yeah. So robots aren't the yeah. scary enemies. Mm. And so we, what we did, so instead of having Will Smith with this phalanx of evil robots, we made the good robot a main character with the woman. And then we didn't talk about just the simple man versus robot death battle. It was about the Asimov's three laws of robotics and the, the, the laws were broken and how what's the future's in peril is kind of the... the bad translation of the Japanese copy. And then we made, in all of the materials, the, the, the robot, the good robot, was a main character, and, and we did phenomenal. We, did, we, had, we won an award for the best box office mm -hmm. internationally. We beat the UK, which the UK has always beat, beat us on every box so office. So your advice there to someone is to, to understand what headquarters wants, but yep. understand what the consumer wants or the buyer wants here, and, and yep. don't be led necessarily by what worked in the States, basically. Absolutely. And then, but the, sometimes they still don't listen. Uh -huh. So, okay. so what, what I had to do is do market research and say, okay, here's the U.S. stuff, here's the Japanese stuff. Which one do you like? You know, and and we did all this survey and say, okay, sir, consumers are telling us this, and then after we did that, well, they get so they gave us reluctantly permission to use our materials in Japan, and then um, uh, uh, once we use that and had success, then um, they they didn't force the stuff from the U.S. on us anymore. So. If you have that success, again, like with, you know, newspaper, showing a little bit of success, that opens the door up to new things. So, mm. Okay. What's some other advice you give someone who's new? Should they learn Japanese, for example? Absolutely. They should. Yeah, they mm -hmm. should. Even if you're, you're, you're not good at languages, mm -hmm. just showing... That would be me. <laughs> if you're taking the effort, yeah. um, people, Japanese people respect that. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 the belief is that generally that foreigners can't speak Japanese. Mm. So um, it's okay. You know, it's mm. not like you're in some other, it's not mm. like you're in the U.S. Where well, it's the opposite. Isn't it? Like we expect foreigners to speak Absolutely. perfect English, right? Absolutely, yeah. And very little flexibility and tolerance when they don't, right? Yes. Well, they're annoyed. Yes. Why yes. don't you speak proper English, right? Right. right. That's, that's unfortunately the U.S. is a lot like that. Mm. So, But in Japan, the people don't really expect that. No. So no. Um, it's, it's okay. It's a shock. Yeah. So, oh, you, wow, you speak such good. How do you... How do you speak such a good angle? Uh, With that Yamagata bend. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's, it's just showing that effort and then understanding the Japanese culture and, and enjoying Japanese food and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That somehow brings sort of 
you closer to mm -hmm. to your staff, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so that's also very important. Mm, nice. Anything I haven't asked you yet um, about leadership and your experiences here, uh, John, that I should have asked? Yes, quite a bit. So I, we I, did. We covered a fair bit, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. I think. Yeah. I guess. Um, you know. I think that the advice is, you know, be be patient mm -hmm. um, and try try to understand and pick up the nuances mm -hmm. of Japanese culture because it's very difficult mm. when you're coming from a particularly a U.S. Perspective, because mm. everybody's in your face, and it's open. Yeah. Right? Everything's, yeah, everything's open. We go it's to in the your meeting, face. we exchange yeah. ideas, yeah. we debate, we fight it out, we make a decision. Everyone's clear where you stand, and then you go, and then you yeah. go. Right in Japan, not like that at all. Right? Not at all. Not at all. Mm. So yeah. So one thing, I guess, if I had one thing, um, it is what I, I found really frustrating was the length of time it takes to make a decision, mm. and and finally, um, after I understood why that was going on. Mm -hmm. I was okay with the the process, mm -hmm. and so what I found, what I'd like to say is like usually when you know in a Western perspective, like you just described, you've got some you know challenge, a goal, and so everybody says, okay, let's do this, this, this. okay, good, and we all start running. Mm. In Japan, it's like no, 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 let's okay, what could possibly go wrong yep. on yep. the path to this yep. goal, yep. and so everybody stops. No one's running. They're mm. stopped. They're in mm. a holding pattern. And then they figure it out, and of course you have to encourage them to, to figure it out, you know, and, and work with them, and you know, provide solutions. Well, we tried that before; it never worked. Is one big excuse you always hear. Well, why don't we try it this way, you know, and and, and work things out. But once it's in place, I mean, it's like a factory. It's like people just know, boom, they move. But mm -hmm. then when the goal shifts a little bit, you have to stop, stop again, again. Mm -hmm. and do that whole process again. Mm -hmm. And so that that's in particularly traditional environments, you'll see that. So. Mm -hmm. Once you understand that that's the process, mm. then you won't lose your hair. Like mm. and it totally took me too long to uh, <laughs> realize that. But um, but understand that's that's what people are doing, mm. and they're not saying when they say, "Well, no, that's there's all these problems." They're not saying that they're against the idea, mm. which it, it comes across from our perspective that they're they, opposing. They're us. opposing. Yeah, mm. it's they're not opposing. No, they're just they're trying to figure taking out taking a safe route. Yeah. Like they say, you know, in Japan, it's not uh, so important initially to have the right decision it's more important to have the right questions mm -hmm. so if you think about that logic you know we don't tend to think about what's the right question we're trying to get to the right decision they're thinking about well what is the right questions we should be asking before we even think about a decision what information do we need what don't we know what things do we need to anticipate how can we head this off and i find this myself after all these years, 36 years here, I still get frustrated. You know, i got these ideas, let's do this. And then all I get is, well, I'm not sure about this, I'm not sure about that. And all these, as you say, all these issues are brought up. And you're sitting there thinking... No one wants to do this. Come on. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Why? Why? And then you, you have to rethink. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's melt that down a bit. And as you say, can we come at a different angle? Can we tweak it a bit? Can we do something less? Can we do something more? and find a way through. And so that requires a fair bit of patience and uh, I guess the communication skills too to re you know, really be able to think of it from their point of view. Mm -hmm. And that idea of I'm not opposing this because I'm opposed to you, uh, I'm not opposed to this because it's not a good idea, uh, I'm just putting up issues that may have a negative impact on the business I'm protecting the business by raising this issue. See it in that light. But often we don't see it in that light. We see it as, say, uh, you're dragging your feet, you're not on the team, you know, you're not playing according to the rules here. By the way, I'm the boss, do what I say. You know, we've got yeah. all this stuff going on, right? <laughs> don't do that, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, don't do that. Yeah. So it is a bit hard, isn't it, to readjust? It yeah. is, it really is. Yeah. And, and actually in traditional organizations, that kind of questioning is highly valued, mm. highly valued. And... And, you know, I, when I spoke with seasoned Japanese executives that I worked with in the past and we were in board meetings and things like that, um, I was explaining, like, look, you know, that kind of questioning comes across this way for Westerners. And he would say, he was shocked. He said, oh, I can't believe that. That's, that's what we do, that we have to do that. Um, and so it's a, it's a learning on both sides. And yeah. so how do you come together? Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a great um, TV commercial running on now but from Sagawa Cubin where Sagawa Cubin comes in as their sales team. This is Sagawa Cubin is the delivery service, yes. right? 
Yep. They come into this board <laughs> meeting and they're saying, no, you're, we're the service. And everybody's like having these really hard questions. What about cost? What about this? What? You know, and then, uh, you know, of course, then she explains things and that sort of thing and, and very calmly. But that's a great example of how meetings are held when you have a new idea or a new mm -hmm. presentation. So mm -hmm. don't, don't be upset when you mm. have those hard questions come at you. Mm. Um, that is a great note on which to finish. And I know, I know, we could just keep going. I can <laughs> tell John, talking to you, we could just keep going here because all gold. But thank you. Very insightful today. I really appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the opportunity, Greg. It's great to see you. Thank you. So join us again for our next episode of Japan's Top Business interviews.